All right. <clears throat> Section 2.1 explores solution curves for your differential equations, but we're only going to stick with the first order differential equation. And If you take a look at the differential equation, you have dy dx is equal to something with an x and a y in it. So if you remember back in Calc 1, dy dx is a slope, right? So what we have here essentially is an equation that describes a slope at any particular point. And so it's kind of natural to think about it as a slope field. A differential equation can create a slope field. Well, how can it do that? Let's see if we can come up with an example. I meant to dig out an example before, and uh, I didn't get one. Let's do one that they already did. Which one? Uh, let's do the first one. That's easy. Um, X squared minus Y squared. So what we have here is a essentially a function on the right-hand side with an x and a y in it. So that's uh, what they refer to as f of xy. And then the left-hand side is your derivative, which is a slope. And so what they're saying is that on this xy plane, your slope can be given by this expression x squared minus y squared. So if we were to draw our xy plane, what we could do is we can create a grid of xy points that we would put as an input and then the slope as your output. And so remember back in algebra when you used to plot points and stuff, you're kind of doing the same thing, except your, your input and output looks a little bit different. So your input here is a two-dimensional point, and then your output is a number. Well, that number happens to be the slope. So what we could do is we could say, if I'm at this point 0, 0, then my slope is equal to 0. Now, to represent that slope zero, I would just draw a little, little line segment that has slope zero. Maybe that'll work. Let's try a couple more points. At the point one, one, we got one minus one. That's another horizontal slope. Let's try the point zero, one. I'm sorry, one, zero. So x is equal to one, y is equal to zero. What's the slope? What? Slope is one. So at this point, one, zero, my slope is one. So I'm gonna draw a little line segment that looks like it has slope one. Let's try I don't know what else to try. Let's try. Zero one. So zero one is going to be what? Negative one. So my slope is going to be negative one. So it's decreasing.
Oops, I'm not putting these numbers in. This gets kind of tedious, kind of quickly. Uh, let's try one more. Two zero. What's that? What? Four. So two zero. So that's going to be a steep slope. It's going to look kind of like that. Well, you can see how this could go on for a pretty long time. And so for cases like this, it might be just more appropriate to <laughs> to search the internet for some calculators that would graph this. Slow field generator, maybe? So if we were to graph an x squared minus y squared slope field, it would look something like this. So we graphed very little over here, but if we were to keep going, we would see some, some interesting patterns. So let me take a picture of this and send it to our notes. <laughs> Let's just replace that. <clears throat> so we have, or we could try to imagine, a family of curves happening here. Family of curves. So how is this going to give us a solution? What we could do is we can find a curve by picking a particular point. So let's see if I can pick a particular point here. Um, actually, they have some sample points. Negative 2, comma 1. So if I go to this point, negative 2, comma 1, ooh, what happened? <laughs> Those things just popped out. Um, is that negative 2, comma 1? Okay. So if I go from here, what I would like to do is I'd like to try to follow. This has, I can't see the slope anymore. This, this, this slope looks like it's going up. And then it looks like it's going to level off over here and go down. So what I'm doing is I'm imagining following the slope from that particular point. And the slope looks like it's pretty steep. So I'm going to follow that slope up. And then as I go up, it looks like the next slope that I see looks like it's going to push me back down. So it's going to go down. And then, I don't know, it looks like it's going to go down and it looks like it's going to go back up. And maybe if I miss this slope over here, I can keep going up. I don't know. That looks kind of tricky. So do you kind of see it following a particular flow, so to speak, going from left to right?
So, um, fortunately, these programs usually also have uh, a starting point. So, if I go to that point two one, can I draw the rest of it? Yeah, I don't know if I can draw the rest of it. Maybe we need another one that can draw the rest. So if I pick that point and put it at the point two comma one, negative two comma one, I can kind of see where this is gonna flow. And some of these programs are really nice that if you take that point and move it somewhere, you can kind of see how your your potential, your 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 solution curve might look like based on what your starting point is. So if I have this at negative two comma one, it looks like it's going to go up steeply and then come back down and then it looks like it's going to go up and continue to go up. And it looked like it might, we might even have an asymptote here. Um, one of those asymptotes that are lines that are not horizontal or vertical. You guys remember what that's called? There's an algebra term for that. Oblique, oblique asymptotes. So in this case, we might have x is equal to y as an oblique asymptote. So oh, I guess my drawing wasn't too bad here. It looks like it'll go up like that. And I, I don't, I could try to draw the other side as well, but usually when you have a starting point, that's your starting point for, for values that are bigger than that, and we don't usually look back. So that's a general idea behind a slope field. A slope field will, uh, will, I mean, if you're if you're meticulous enough, you can plot a bunch of little points on an xy plane, and then if you have an initial condition, you can try to follow that initial condition to see where it leads you to the slope field, and then eventually come up with a curve. Okay. So graphically, uh, there's that slope visual that you can use to try to sketch your 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 graph numerically we'll see at the end of this chapter that we'll, we can try to find um, some sort of algorithm to try to plot the points after we compute things numerically and then and then we'll try to analyze how good that approximation is okay um, is this, does this make sense? This idea of a slope field? All right. So you're, um, you can search or the, the worksheet will have some links also for you guys to try to test out some, some software. Uh, the other part of chapter two or section 2.1 is the idea of what's called an aut autonomous differential equation. And again, we're going to stick with first order differential equations. And 
An autonomous differential equation is an equation where your derivative, this is only a first order, the derivative is equal to a function with only a y in it. So that means there's no x's. So the very simple example that we've seen is like that y prime is equal to y. I have to adjust my page here. Sorry. So let's see if we can take a look at y prime is equal to y and just analyze it to death. You guys remember what the solution for this is? E to the x, right? Yeah. Plus c times c plus a times a <laughs> times a. So, um, <clears throat> We have this arbitrary constant, uh, the plus C comes out, and then you raise it to a power and do all that stuff, and we get A times E to the X. And so these curves, so this is a positive uh, power, so these curves tend to, tend to look like this, depending on <clears throat> whether A is positive or negative. And that's going to, you're going to figure that out if you're given an initial condition. And your initial condition would be um, your initial condition would be given to, to, to solve for one of these curves. But the important part here is uh, looking at what's happening to the general solution. And the general solution, if you if you look at these curves, it looks like it's doing something in particular. Um, so this this point that they're calling equilibrium point or a critical point is when the right hand side of this differential equation is equal to zero. So an equilibrium point in our example is when the right hand side is equal to zero. In our example, it's just y, so y is equal to zero, but it could be a little bit more complicated than that. So in this case, y is equal to zero. So that y is equal to zero line is called an equilibrium point or a critical point. So based on this critical point, it looks like we have um, some information about this. If zero is an equilibrium point, then y is equal to zero is a constant solution. So this is a solution to our differential equation. And that's called an equilibrium solution. And if we put y is equal to zero in the original differential equation, we see that it actually does work, right? What's y is equal to zero called again? It's a trivial solution also. So if you have a couple of critical points, then there's no other critical points in between. So that's like the intermediate value theorem or something like that. You might have learned uh, solutions must be strictly increasing or decreasing between the critical points, between the equilibrium points. In other words, between the equilibrium points, you can't have a, a function that looks like a sine wave. Right? It's either going up or going down between equilibrium points. And then... Um, the critical points are also asymptotes for the solutions. And so we can clearly see that, right? Any solution, any A value that we pick is going to have an asymptote at Y is equal to zero. Okay. So let's take a look at another example that's not so simple.
I'm just going to make this easy. Uh, X, oops, I can't have any X's autonomous. Um, y minus 1, Y plus 2. <clears throat> so um, we could clearly see that we have critical points here or equilibrium points at y is equal to 1 and y is equal to negative 2, right? <clears throat> so, but this is kind of interesting. Let's, let's see if we could take a look at the, the graph of this, uh, the, the slope fields. So let's take out our slope field calculator. And let's put in, what was it again? Where is it? Y minus one. Does it know that it's going to multiply? Y plus two. I wonder if we can take this out. All right, so if we focus on this, um, this slope field, picture. So if we focus on the slope field, we can see um, these facts should hold we have um, y equals 1, y equals 2, negative 2. And then if c is an equilibrium point, then x or y is equal to c, the constant is a possible solution, right? So if I take my dot over here and put it, <laughs> I can't, well, if I put it right on that line, then that line is a possible solution. And if I take my dot and put it on the other line, and this line is another possible solution. Okay. Uh, if C1 is less than C2, then there are no other critical points between those two. So I, between negative 2 and negative 1, there's no other critical points. That makes sense. Solutions must be strictly increasing or decreasing between the critical points. So if I'm all the way up here, looks like my solution is strictly increasing. There's no bound there's no other critical point above that if i'm between these two my solution is strictly decreasing i'm not going to bounce up i'm not going to take this graph and bounce back up and then if i'm below that i'm also strictly increasing okay and then these critical points are also asymptotes so in other words if I were to draw some solution curves over here, well, probably not a good looking one. Let's see, if I can follow these curves, I would shoot up kind of quickly. That's one possible solution that's strictly increasing, or over here, another possible solution that's also strictly increasing. And then if I was between these two curves, my curves would have an asymptote here. It'll drop down, and then it'll approach that other critical point as an asymptote. So that's uh, those are some of the properties of the equilibrium points. And if you notice, if 
you imagine collapsing this into just a straight line, we can kind of get the big picture already. You know what I mean? If you imagine collapsing this. into just the y-axis, we can view this from a one-dimensional point of view. You have y is equal to 1 and y is equal to negative 2 as your equilibrium points. And then if you have any points that are above 1, then It'll be increasing. If you're if you have any points that are below one, you're also going to be increasing. And then if you have points between one and negative two, you're going to be decreasing. So a one-dimensional this this is called a face portrait. A one-dimensional graph is a good view of what's happening in an autonomous differential equation. Because all you really care about are the equilibrium points. And then you care about how the graph is going to behave between the equilibrium points. And then after that, if you really want to sketch the graph and find specific values for your independent variable, then you would draw out the graph. But aside from that, you can kind of get some idea of how this is going to look like with a one-dimensional graph called a face portrait. Phase, P-H-A-S-E. All right. So a couple more words about these autonomous differential equations. If a solution curve will approach an equilibrium point, and by approaching, we're always talking about going from left to right. If you're going from left to right, and your curve is approaching your equilibrium point, then that is called a stable equilibrium point. If your curve moves away from your equilibrium point, like one, regardless of what curve I choose, my curves are moving away from the equilibrium point, then that is called an unstable equilibrium point. So the other words that they use are attractor or repeller. It attracts or repels your solutions. And there are some cases where curves above it might go away and then curves below it might approach it. And so those cases are called semi-stable. And again, we're looking at this from left to right. And you can view this without the curves, right? You should be able to view this just by looking at the slope field. Generally, where, is the where are the slopes taking you? Are they taking you away an equilibrium point, or are they taking you toward an equilibrium point? So depending on which way it's going, you have an attractor or a repeller, or if it goes both ways, then it's called a semi-stable equilibrium point. <clears throat> so 
So in our example, we have an unstable equilibrium point at y equals 1, and we have a stable equilibrium point at y equals negative 2. Questions? Uh, here's a last definition, a one-dimensional face portrait. So with a one-dimensional face portrait, you can view uh, the curves either going up or going down. <clears throat> Remember using the first derivative test? Remember that? So first derivative test, you, you find the critical points and you test around it, see whether something is increasing or decreasing. So it kind of works the same way here. You have the points uh, 1 and negative 2, and you test the points around it, whether they're positive or negative, and that tells you whether the functions are increasing or decreasing. So your worksheet will be examining um, slope fields and finding solutions to slope fields. So it looks like the GeoGebra slope field is a good one to use. Uh, there's uh, a couple of others that I suggest that you try. And then it's going to ask you to graph the, face, graph the, the slope field and that's probably just a matter of you copying and pasting onto a document. And then uh, you can draw out by hand or you can have the computer draw out a couple of solutions to, uh, to the differential equation given some initial conditions. So you have two of those problems to do and then the other two problems to do are uh, making a face portrait. All right, ready to move on? Let's move on. So we did separable differential equations already, and I'm hoping you're comfortable with that. Uh, just find a way to separate. There's going to be some differential equations that are not separable, so watch out for that. So let's jump into our next topic, which is uh, a first order linear equation. Oops. Oh, he's got to shrink the page. So first order linear differential equation looks like this. And remember, we, we kind of defined linear. And the idea behind linear is that your, your dependent variable, the variable that you're trying to solve for, which is y, and its derivatives are not being put in into any functions like the square root or any of the power functions or sines or cosines or exponentials. And so uh, it doesn't matter what a sub 1 is or a sub 0 is, as long as the y's themselves are not being raised to the power. And if we're talking about first order, then the only y's that should exist would be the derivative of y with respect to the variable, the independent variable, and maybe the y itself. So those are the only two 
whys that should exist and they shouldn't be, you know, composed with another function. So once you have something like this, you have what's called a linear, first order linear differential equation. Now, what are you going to do with that first order linear differential equation? Uh, so these things tend to not be separable because there's an addition over here. Um, but if you can separate it, that's always the first thing you want to try to do is separate it. Kind of like u substitution for integrals. That's usually your first shot at taking an integral of something. And if that doesn't work, you dig into your bag of other tricks. So the next step to look for is that, is this a first order linear? <clears throat> and if it is, what we're going to do is we're going to try to rewrite it in standard form. And that just requires you to get rid of that a sub 1 of x just by dividing it out. Hopefully you don't introduce any weird infinity zero things. But you're going to divide out by that term. And then now you have a first order linear differential equation in standard form. So here's where we need to try to remember a little bit of uh, derivative stuff. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and say, hey, this kind of looks like There's a y and y prime there. So um, <clears throat> and it's a derivative. So do you remember taking the derivative of something with a y in it and then getting y prime plus a y term? When does that happen? I don't even know if I'm asking my question correctly. <laughs> the chain rule, but not the chain rule. The, the product rule. So you remember the product rule? Derivative of the first time the second, something like that. So recall the product rule. You want d dx of something. Uh, let's call this. Geez, we're running out of variables here. I was going to say g or f h. So it's like first times the derivative of the second plus derivative of the first times the second. So it kind of looks like that, right? So h of x dy dx plus h prime of x times y. So we have these dy dx and the y, except our p of x and this is just the one uh, don't kind of doesn't quite match with the h and h prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to force it to match with the h and h prime, which means we essentially want p to be the derivative of something that we're going to multiply this by. So we need to multiply equation by some factor that they tend to call mu. So that mu prime of x is equal to p 
of x times mu of x right does that make sense no so i want to multiply this differential equation by some factor mu all the way through and for, for us to not change the value of this equation we have to multiply everything on both sides I want to multiply this so that it would match my my product rule. And if I could do that, then I can rewrite the left-hand side of the equation as a derivative of a product. So if I imagine this to be a result of a product rule, I have my dy dx and my y here. That means h of x should equal to mu of x, and h prime of x should equal to mu of x times p of x. Right? If I get that to match correctly. Yes. Both. Yeah. Yeah. What's H of X? H of X is mu of X. Oh, I'm going to get too many lines now. Right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's start over. All right. So this is our task. Let's try to multiply the equation by some function so that the left-hand side would kind of look like a product rule, okay? So in my product rule, I have some unknown function that I'm right now calling h of x. And according to my product rule, I'm gonna get h of x dy dx plus h prime of x y of x. Now that looks really close to what I have here or even better after I multiply the equation by this at the moment unknown mu of x function if I multiply this equation by mu of x, then this is what I would have. So what I want to do is I want to match up my left-hand side to make it look like a product rule. So if I match that up, what do I have in that first set of arrows that says mu of x is equal to h of x, right? And my second one that says h prime of x should equal to mu of x times p of x. Right? What is H of X? H of X is mu of X. So 
So I want to know what mu of x is. How are we going to solve for mu of x? Hey, it's a separable differential equation, right? So, um, let's see if we can take this and rewrite it so that it looks like a separable differential equation that we kind of uh, are more familiar with. Let me just drop the of x portions of it. And my variables are just mu and x. So I have mu prime over mu equals p of x. It's separable. So we can integrate it. ln of mu integral of p of x plus c. Yeah, there's a plus C in there. We haven't integrated yet, so let's keep the plus C in there somewhere. So if we solve for mu, which is essentially what we want, we will um, we will get e to the integral of p of x. Yes. Uh, where did it go? Ah, I guess I should have written this as um, d, d mu over dx. And so this would have been a d mu, and then the dx would have been on this side. Maybe that's better. This is a mu over here. So d mu over mu is ln mu, or the antiderivative of that. OK. All right, so um, so that's it. <laughs> that's your integrating factor. <clears throat> so once you put that into here, Once you put that into there, we're going to get um, this right hand is actually a product. A product rule of mu of x times y. Right? And you're solving for y, so all you have to do now is integrate both sides and then divide by mu of x. When you integrate the left hand side, It'll just be mu of x times y. And then you just divide by mu of x. So you can look at this as a, as a formula at the end, but usually in practice, 
uh, we tend to go through the process of finding the integrating factor and then solving for this by taking the antiderivatives. So I think it would be good if we do an example and then try to come back to this page to see if this makes sense again. Does it make sense now? Because if it does, then it's great. <laughs> but it doesn't. So let's do an example and see if we can come back and make sense out of it. All right, example. Where are we? Section 2.3. Um, should we start off with something like number three? Nice and easy. Kind of ease us into this. I don't know if it's easy, but. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so. Now instead of let's 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 try to see if we can make up an algorithm, a step-by-step -step process for solving linear first order linear differential equations. And um, the first thing we want to look for is to make sure that it is in fact a first order linear differential equation. And then we can write it in this form. Right? So the first thing we want to look for is um, well first step, let's call it step zero. Make sure it's uh, first order linear. I probably should be typing this. You guys getting used to my handwriting yet? Probably take half a semester and then you'll figure it out. <laughs> Next step is you want to find the integrating factor, and that's going to take little sub-steps. So the first little sub-step, uh, 1a, we'll call it, is what is p? So if it's written in the correct form, in, quote, standard form, then our p is going to be that function that's being multiplied by the y, right? So y prime uh, dy dx is by itself, and then that function next to the y is going to be your p. What is that function next to the y in this case? So it's just a constant. Makes things easy for us. So the next step after that is to the integrating factor mu equals e raised to the integral of p of x. So integral of p of x is what? x. Now, just a word about constants for integrating factors is that if you come up with an integrating factor and you're going to come up with a constant, that constant is going to kind of merge with the other constant in the second integral that you're going to take. And so we generally don't put that there. And uh, I would like to not deal with that. And I would like for you to explore on your own what happens if you add this arbitrary constant plus C here and then carry that to the end of the problem. And you'll see how that will merge with the other constants that you'll take. 
at the end. We found our integrating factor, e to the x, right? So the next step after that is to multiply the whole equation by the integrating factor. So let's bring this back on this side. So now that I got my integrating factor, I'm going to multiply everything by mu of x. Right? And then what you want to do is you want to rewrite the left hand side. as a product rule. By that, I mean as a derivative of a product of two things. And what's a product of two things? It's the integrating factor times y. And you can double check that. Integrating factor was e to the x and then times y. You can double check that since you know how to take the, um, the product rule, right? Just take the derivative of this real quick. So it's the first times the derivative of the second plus uh, the derivative of the first times the second. Product rule. If you have an opportunity to simplify the right-hand side, go ahead and do that. This is 4x, right? I hope. And now integrate. And here's where the plus C that you would have gotten up in the integrating factor would merge in with this plus C after you do this integral. So if you integrate this, the integral of a derivative, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, is the original function. So we have the original function. And this could generate a plus C, but we'll bring it over to the other side. And now we integrate this. Sometimes this is an easy integral, sometimes it's not. And because this is innately a product of two functions, a lot of times this integral that you would be taking here would be some sort of integration by parts. So be ready for that. Did I do my integral correctly? All right. Oh, Chris is in the other class. He was my arithmetic checker. I need a calculus. Make sure I do my calculus correctly. And then just solve for y. Now, when you solve for y, some of the things that they might ask you would be, um, there's, uh, there's these terms in this called the transient terms. And transient terms uh, end up contributing very little as x gets larger and larger. Yes? Transient. Transient terms are these, um, these terms where as x goes off to infinity, they get closer and closer to zero. And so because you're dividing by something that tend to have an exponential function involved, uh, we have these functions that are going to go to zero as x approaches zero. So really this, 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 this solution is going to be dominated by this function that's not a transient term. Say it again? No, we, st we don't call it zero. We just call it transient term because as it gets larger, it'll contrib contribute less and less. But, you know, we're still a finite space. It still might contribute enough to make a difference.
So that whole process is the idea or is this is the algorithm for solving linear differential equations. Um, is that a little bit better? Let's take a look at the previous page again and see if this is This makes a little bit more sense. So the idea, remember, was to multiply by something so that the left-hand side of your linear equation looks like a product rule, right? And so to force it, to make it look like a product rule, we do some substitutions, we do some weird substitutions, and then we're going to call this special function that we're going to multiply by, uh, we're going to call that an integrating factor. So once we figure out the integrating factor, we multiply it, and then we're essentially guaranteed that this is going to be a product rule. All right? And so that's how we got to solve for this. That's this business over here, making sure that your mu, your integrating factor, contributes so that it looks like a product rule. And then once we do that, you just treat it like a product rule. So it's a derivative of a product. You undo the derivative by taking the integral, and then you continue to just solve for y, which is what you want to do from the beginning. OK? Um, <clears throat> these problems tend to ask for Uh, give the largest interval, i, which the general solution is defined, and determine if there's any transient terms. So, like I said, the transient terms, see, that was in my notes. Kind of left my notes here. Uh-oh, I have four steps in my notes, and I just did five. With a zero step. Oh, no. Well, just look at my notes. <clears throat> so as x approaches 0, this first term goes off to infinity. And x approaches 0, the second term goes to 0. I'm sorry, approaches infinity. As x approaches infinity, so we have a transient term. which says that it's going to contribute less and less as x gets larger. And then uh, they generally ask what the largest interval is where you would be guaranteed a unique solution. And it looks like I can put any value in for x, right? So any value for x would work. So in this particular scenario, your domain goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. So, in some cases, when you divide by something, uh, your x, your denominator might be zero, and so you want to stay away from that. And so the largest interval might be just a positive real numbers, or might be real numbers starting from three, or something like that. So we want to account for things like that. All right, so this is one example. I encourage you to do some more examples with your homework. And uh, take a look at your assignment, your, your worksheet assignment, and uh, try out some of, those, uh, some of those programs where you get to do the slope fields. See you guys on whatever Thursday.